уважаеми господин министр председател Борисов, уважаеми господин министр председател. Uh, distinguished Prime Minister Борисов, distinguished Prime Minister Blankovic, distinguished uh, Mr. Weber, distinguished Mr. Zurinda, Your Excellencies, Ministers, dear guests. The new strategy for the Western Balkans of the European Commission gave a new European perspective for the countries in the region. The 2025 horizon is a new chance for the region to complete all the domestic reforms required. The European Union needs to start discussing and communicating these opportunities not only with the politicians but with the societies in the Western Balkans. They are the ones to act as a motivating factor for the governments in the next five to seven years, and they should be ones, the ones to push for reforms. Therefore, one of the major objectives of the European Union is to embark upon an active dialogue with the media, the analysts, the experts, the NGOs, the academia, and count on their involvement in the process. I'm extremely grateful to the Prime Minister Borisov for having embraced the idea of holding today's dialogue between the Bulgarian presidency, the civic sector and the European institutions. I thank the Bulgarian presidency, the Wilfred Martin Center and the European Council on Foreign Relations with which we partner uh, with the European Movement International to, or to organize this forum. The role of the civil society is essential in facilitating and uh, monitoring the process of reforms in the Western Balkans. This is why it is very important to, to hold dialogue with these societies uh, because this is the only way to make the citizens of the Western Balkans our allies in the process of Europeanization of the region. I believe that everybody needs strengthened dialogue, and I believe that this conference will lay the foundations uh, for the discussion. This is why we have the representatives of the Bulgarian presidency, uh, Prime Minister Borisov, um, Deputy Prime Minister and Minister of Foreign Affairs Ekaterina Zakharyeva, the Minister uh, for the Bulgarian Presidency Liliana Pavlova, as well as the, the Chairperson of uh, the Foreign Affairs Committee in the Bulgarian Parliament, Gemma Guruzdanova, uh, members of the European Parliament and um, uh, the President of, for Bul of Bulgaria for the period 2012-2017, Rosen uh, Plevnyev. I commend them because in less than five months of the Bulgarian presidency, this dialogue with the Western Balkans has, has stepped up with concrete and measurable achievements. It's extremely valuable that we have with us the Prime Minister of Croatia, Andrei Plenković, uh, who is one of the European leaders uh, who has contributed considerably for the debate of the European integration and perspective of the Western Balkans. We have uh, with us uh, the chairperson of the largest uh, parliamentary group uh, of the European Parliament, Marfrin Weber, who has been extremely um, consistent in his policy on uh, the Western Balkans. Uh, along with the um, Hans Eidel um, Foundation, they held a very important uh, forum in Brussels. Oh, we also have um, uh, Wilfred Martin Center, Mikolas Zurinda with us, and the Deputy Chair of the European Council on Foreign Relations, Vesel Cherneva. As a chairperson of uh, the largest network of pro-European organization um, represented in 39 uh, countries, uh, European Movement uh, International, I'm extremely happy that the door uh, of, to the European perspective of the Western Balkans has been open. We can congratulate ourselves on the achievement, but we cannot um, Rest, uh, rest at this stage because the criteria are that the six countries and member states of the EU should uh, try to achieve are clear cut. But these are not only good intentions, this is a commitment with a solid uh, financial uh, support um, framework. Bulgaria has been on this journey and has completed it uh, quite recently and is well aware of the efforts required at all levels, but is also well aware of the 
benefits um, that come with this uh, convergence with the European Union. I believe that it's a common cause in order for all these efforts to um, materialize, uh, the governments, uh, the European institutions and the civil sector should make sure that intentions and reforms become reality. None of us wishes uh, just to have a box ticking exercise. Uh, the limited window of opportunity which we have and should be used wisely. And this event offers a channel for dialogue um, between all the sectors. Uh, the uh, European Movement International, uh, the European um, Council on Foreign Affairs and the Martin Center and the Bulgarian uh, presidency will continue to foster that dialogue. Allow me now to invite uh, Mr. Durinda, uh, the chairperson of Martin's uh, Center for a um, short uh, introduction. Dear Prime Minister, dear Boyko, dear Andre, dear Chairman, dear Manfred, Ministers, ladies and gentlemen, I thank Eva Maedo, member of the European Parliament and the president of the European Movement International for the idea to organize the conference and for inviting the Martin Center to co-organize the event. Well, we need to address a number of challenges facing the EU and the entire international community in these days. It is good that despite all turbulences, the integration process of the Western Balkan countries is getting new impetus. It would be great if the EU is bigger in 2025 again, especially after the UK's departure from the EU. Let's be frank, open and honest since the beginning. The question whether we will be bigger or not depends mostly or substantially on the candidate countries. More concretely, on three factors. On their will to join our community. We know the community of shared values. The second, on the ability to meet all required criteria, economic but also political ones. And number three, on their decisiveness that they are a part of the solution, not a part of the problem. What we can do, what we are trying to do, is to share our best experience from the process of transition in the EU countries thus far. There are some positive recent experiences, such as the countries of Visegrad 4. As you know, the Czech Republic, Slovakia, settled all issues of the past before joining the EU. We develop regional cooperation for the benefit of all four countries. Not everything is good in Visegrad 4. We are pe perceived in these days as migration recalcitrants to some extent, but we are struggling at the end of the day to bring to a possible solution. So what I am speaking and calling about is national reconciliation, a peaceful settlement of the past, good neighborly relations, regional cooperation, and a lot of reforms in order to be competitive enough, but also compatible enough. Let's remember, dear friends, at the end of the day, and the end of the enlargement process, ratification of it is needed. To succeed in this process means to be well prepared and to enjoy the support of our citizens for the final decision. Let's remember, it is our citizens who are the main stakeholders of the enlargement. Citizens in the candidate countries, but also member countries. We need to work with our people, with our citizens. The Martin Center is at your disposal at the disposal of every candidate country. I know that people in the Western Balkans think that it is not the EU, but the big powers from the North and from the Far East are the biggest partners and investors. Even though 76% of the region's total trade volume is made with the EU, even though almost 9 billion euros 
have been given during the last decade to the region by the EU. There is a significant gap between what the EU has already accomplished and how it is perceived by people in the region. It is needed to change these misleading narratives in our societies. Non-governmental organizations, civil society organizations, are in a position to do that. To do, to do that. We already organized a number of activities in our center in Brussels, but also in the region, especially in cooperation with Konrad Adenauer Stiftung. But we have also a number of our member and partner foundations in the region, in your countries. And not only in Bulgaria, even though AGERP is a very active NGO, but also in Croatia, in Romania, but also in Serbia, Bosnia and Herzegovina, and Albania. Initiative from the bottom is crucial, decisive, the most important. So let's get together. The road ahead, and I know I am speaking about, because my country has a lot of experience in this direction. The road ahead is bumpy, but the destination, the final destination, is worth of effort. Thank you very much. Good luck. Thank you. Now it's my very big pleasure to welcome the chairman of the largest political group in the European Parliament, Mr. Manfred Weber. So Eva, Mikolas, the Prime Ministers, Andrei Boyko, ladies and gentlemen, thanks so much for the invitation to be part of this uh, conference today of civil society in the Western Balkan. It's great to be here, especially because we need civil society to develop, to have a positive future, and that's why I want to thank you for your engagement, for your efforts, for your countries, and for the whole region. I said today already several times, Boyko, that uh, Sofia is the capital of Europe today, and, uh, and the Bulgarian government is leading Europe in a really very proper way. Very, very good. It is well received what the Bulgarian president did in the last uh, uh, month already for Europe. But uh, this summit shows that there is one, let me say, bigger question behind the Bulgarian president. It's not only about to deliver on the legislative work, which is really a good work, I have to say, but it's, uh, but it's also an important contribution from a geographical point of view. I must say in the, last dec in the last years, when I remember what we discussed on European level, it was a lot about crises. It was about, about Euro crisis, it was about the migration crisis, and frankly speaking, the Western Balkan question was not so high on the agenda in Brussels like it should have had been. And that's why it is an important contribution from Boyko Borisov, from the government of uh, Bulgaria, to put the Western Balkan again on the top on the headline of the European decision-making process. Thank you for this. And I want to say that uh, the Western Balkan countries have partners and friends, even friends, in the European Parliament, in the EPP group, in our political family. I want to underline that uh, Andrei Kovacev is, as vice president of the EPP group, responsible for the Western Balkan, is dealing a lot with the region, is present there. Eva, your engagement here is a strong contribution. Thanks for this. And probably, Andrei, you allow me to refer to people like Doris Pack in the, f in the former years. She was a member of the European Parliament and a strong friend of Croatia. So friends in the European Parliament can help, can assist, can really path the way for, um, for members, for future members of the European Union. So that's important to see, and I want to underline that you have a lot of these friends. Well, that is a starting point. Second message I want to put on the table is that uh, Europe uh, needs the Western Balkans, and the Western Balkans needs Europe. There is a clear European perspective. Um, but I have to say that the enlargement perspective is not popular at all in the European Union. That's not due to the concrete uh, countries on the table. It's nothing against somebody. But the enlargement process, there is a kind of... Uh, of um, reluctance inside of the European Union when we talk about enlargement. 
And what could be a possible answer? One political answer I have to say is that uh, we have to give the people inside of the European Union an idea about where do we think that Europe is ended, it has its end, where there are the borders of Europe. I make it very concrete. When I would say to the citizens in France, in Netherlands, in Germany, in Austria, that we would say that Turkey cannot become a member of the European Union because uh, the Kurdish region close to the Iraq border is not Europe. Uh, we want to have close cooperation, but that is not Europe. If we would be clear on this point, that Turkey cannot become a member of the European Union, then there would be more readiness in a lot of members of member states of the European Union to include the Western Balkan countries inside of the European Union. So the fear that the process is an endless process, there is no border, is a fundamental problem uh, in, in, in the political discussion in the European Union. I would add another point. I think we have to fight much more to show people in the today's European Union how high the positive effect of a possible enlargement could be economically. So I have the figures here that Croatia has today 2.2 times more economic strength than Serbia compared with the figures of 1990. And compared with Albania, it's three times more. So everybody can see that it is for all of us a big positive contribution if we do the enlargement. Security, organized crime, uh, on the question of fight against corruption, the rule of law, everybody knows the positive effects of a possible, possible enlargement. Another element which we can use to convince people for, for a new European way for the Western Balkan is that we need in the next years very concrete projects. There, I follow 100% what Boyko Borisov was always insisting it, that we cannot only theoretically talk about the region, we have to do now practically something on infrastructure, on roaming, on a common economic zone in the region to be very practical. That will be a big contribution to a positive spirit when we talk about the Western Balkan. And um, I must also be, let me be frank, Nicolas was also saying that let's be frank in the discussions. Um, the Western Balkan countries have also answered the questions, why do they do the reforms in way of uh, democracy, in the direction of fight against uh, corruption, in the question of implement, implementation of the rule of law principle. Sometimes when we discuss about these uh, uh, questions, there is a feeling that some are arguing you have to do the reforms uh, to become a member of the European Union. And I say, no, that's not the reason. That cannot be the reason, and you share this for sure. The reason for these positive developments is not to become a member of the European Union. The reason for doing the necessary steps is to have a modern society, to develop in the direction of a modern society. The third point I want to put on the table is uh, that also the European Union must be ready for the Western Balkan. Um, um, I have to say that uh, the European Union is today not prepared for six additional members of the European Union. When I see today's discussion about how we react on the embassy question in Jerusalem for uh, the American ambassador, embassies there, then I have to say that we are, we are blocked in our external affairs because we have the principle of unanimous vote in the Foreign Affairs Council, and that is blocking the whole ambitious to be a strong partner on global level as Europeans. So we have to change our working profile if we want to have additional six members in the European Union uh, from the Western Balkans. We have to deliver on the very concrete questions on the table, MFF, to be ready to have the, enough money on European level and also on the current uh, political challenges, migration and the Euro reform. And finally, ladies and gentlemen, to sum up, um, I think the discussion about the Western Balkans only gives us an indication why are we doing the whole efforts for creating a strong European Union. And that is not mainly about the competition with Russia, Turkey, Saudi Arabia, or others who try to get influence in the region. That is for sure an, uh, an argument, but that is not the main argument. The main argument is another one, that we as EPP, we simply believe and we, we fight for the idea that we as Europeans have a common identity, a common European way of life, a common thinking, how we should organize a society. And the key question for all of us is, 
why we are in favor of such a strong European Union with Western Balkans inside of the European Union is to make clear that we only can defend this European way of life in a globalized world if we stay together. Otherwise, we have no chance to defend our values and our common convictions. Thanks so much for this Congress. Thanks for inviting me. Wish you good discussions. Thank you, Chairman Weber. Now I would like to uh, welcome to the floor one of our two Prime Ministers present today, Mr. Andrei Plenković, a convinced pro-European and a friend of the Western Balkans. Andrei, you have the floor. I congratulate you. Dear Boyko, dear Manfred, dear Ministers, Andrei, Dear Mikulas, dear friends from the civil society in the Western Balkans countries, it's a great pleasure to be here in Sofia at this event which together with the great efforts of the European Council for Foreign Relations and the Wilfried Martin Center represents another excellent opportunity together with the European movement which is now led by Eva and this is a great I would say honor for Bulgaria. You have a great MEP and at the same time president of the most perhaps referential uh, international NGO for Europe because this is the year where we will celebrate 70 years of the Hague Congress and you can be proud as Bulgarians that Eva is uh, leading this organization. Uh, I think that uh, Boyko's initiative to hold after 15 years, 15 years, after first Zagreb in 2000 and then Thessaloniki in 2003, a summit between the leaders of the EU member states and the heads of state and government of the Western Balkans countries is an event per se. This demonstrates that it has taken us 15 years to put the region back to the agenda in this format at the level of the heads of state and government of the European Union. This might now, since it's happening, look simple, but it was not. Because many of you, and I see there are many experienced analysts, Goran, uh, here in this room, who will remember that the initial idea back in 2003 was to hold three annual summits. So the idea was have 2006, 9, 12, 15, and come to 2018. They did not take place. They did not take place. Um, <clears throat> last week, I delivered a speech at my uh, law faculty in Zagreb and explained that there was one simple and clear difference vis-a-vis -vis the enlargement uh, in the decade that has passed, uh, the first decade of 2000 and the 90s. In the 90s, the political responsibility of the West vis-à-vis -vis the countries who were unfortunately on the wrong side of the Iron Curtain was an expression of solidarity to be given to the friends who did not live in democracies for 45 years. It was an embodiment of the message of John Paul II in his speech in the European Parliament in 1988 when he in a way anticipated the fall of the communist regimes by saying we should allow the other lung of Europe to breathe. And this policy was characterized by open hands. You were deprived, you lived in a monoparty system, no democracy, planned economy, totalitarian regimes. The tectonic changes happened, we are here to extend the hand and help you catch up with us. And what was the product of the 90s? The product of the 90s was a swift development, economic transition, political institution building, and uh, institutional acceleration of the Central and Eastern European countries towards the EU. Finalized on the 1st of May 2004 and the 1st of January 2007 when Bulgaria and Romania joined the other 10 countries. For this part of the world which is on our agenda today, the Western Balkans, the history was not as 
forthcoming as it was for these 12 states. First of all, because of the policies of Milosevic regime, who, with its aggressive policies, created war in Slovenia, in Croatia, in Bosnia and Herzegovina, later on in Kosovo. That's why the 90s, for instance, for my country, were completely lost in terms of the EU accession. I said to the young law students, we were a footnote country in the 90s. No contractual relations, no financial assistance, no pre-accession programs. The only thing we had was the <coughs> autonomous trade measures, humanitarian aid, and an ad hoc political dialogue, all the way until 2000. And that's why that Zagreb summit, the first one based on the initiative of Chirac and Mesic, who was the Croatian president at the time, opened the European perspective vis-à-vis -vis the countries in the region. This was key. And only after that, the acceleration came. Unfortunately, after Thessaloniki, we slowed down the dynamics for many reasons, the enlargement fatigue, the consequences of the Big Bang, the rising populism, the institutional crisis, many elements which somehow created a more reserved stance in the EU member states vis-à-vis -vis the enlargement. And the consequence was the slower enlargement. That's why in this last year of the current mandate of the European Parliament, Manfred, and the last year of the Juncker's Commission mandate, it is key that we have witnessed a far more ambitious, far more open and far more dynamic strategy that has been published recently by the Commission, giving more optimism for the countries in the region. And this is a big novelty, almost paving the way for the agenda until 2025. And this is why I think this moment should be seized, first and foremost by the governments and the leaders and the political parties, but also by the civil society of all the countries in the region which are basically grouped out of six in two, two, two situation. And uh, to build upon the logic of the individual merits, the logic of the instruments and mechanisms helping the countries to go forward, to build upon better connectivity, because a sort of uh, a subtitle of this summit will be the better connectivity, which is certainly a need for the countries and the peoples in the region, because we all know how difficult it is to get by plane from one capital to another, let alone uh, road or railway transportation. So uh, this is also part of our responsibility and our priorities. And that's why I would like all of us to use this push, including an excellent EPP summit declaration, uh, a very good uh, text that has been uh, prepared also by the European Council and the Webe uh, countries tomorrow, as well as the input coming from you today. As the Croatian Prime Minister already started, we will repeat this summit in 2020 in the altered circumstances, new multi-annual financial framework adopted, new commission, new council new parliament. That will be a chance to build upon the progress which will be done. We will do together with Boyko and other EU member states, neighbors of the countries in the Western Balkans, to do as much help as we can, not only by transferring our knowledge, our experience, our experts, but creating a conducive atmosphere. This is key the conducive atmosphere in the publics, in the political parties, groups, and finally within the institutions which are supposed to be taking the key decisions. And for that we need to work a lot, because Europe is changing on a daily basis. Look at the national elections, look at the consequences of the first trends which were shown by the strong improvement of the ratings of the populist, literally anti-systemic, anti-establishment, and at the end of the day, anti-European political parties. This is certainly a danger for enlargement.
the stronger those parties will become, the less enlargement will happen. It is as simple and as clear to understand. Therefore, uh, my message is uh, we should seize the moment, seize the enthusiasm, seize the initiative by Boyko, and echo in our work the input and still the enthusiastic thrive that exists among the members of the civil society and most of all among the peoples of the countries in the region. Croatia is here to help. I zajedno sa Bugarskom ćemo učiniti sve da to bude brže nego što je bilo do sada. Hvala vam. Thank you, Prime Minister Plenković. Now I would like to have the the final official uh, speech and invite uh, uh, one of the um, main advocates of this um, initiative, uh, the Prime Minister of Bulgaria, Borisov. Uh, he will share his vision. I'd like to first uh, address, these are friends, um, long-term uh, friends, they are not even guests I, we meet regularly. I will address uh, the civil sector, the NGOs, all of you that have been pressure, pressurizing uh, the um, e political elites uh, for working better. So I'd like to share with you what uh, our vision is and what we plan to do and what we have done. I'm a person who uh, likes to uh, have uh, the memories of the past uh, being uh, alive in our conscience uh, because uh, prime ministers come and go, but uh, the countries are here to stay. So 15 years ago, it was Greece, uh, not in Thessaloniki, that gave the European perspective for Bulgaria and Romania. And we should always remember that very well. Today, in Sofia, we have gathered uh, the uh, leaders of the European Union and of the leaders of the Western Balkans. And it was very difficult uh, to, con to have a dialogue on this specific topic because we are so busy with our uh, issues and problems of the uh, within the European Union but they but in the end they agreed and not only agreed but they embraced this idea and this uh, the, uh, the, con the main contribution of this uh, is due to uh, Chancellor Merkel uh, I don't know if she'll receive the Nobel Prize for Peace but we have a lot to thank her for on the Balkans uh, so we had um, uh, so many formal meetings, and as Andre said, a lot of things uh, were supposed to happen, but they did not. What I can say uh, clearly uh, on the map over there, it is uh, put uh, in a straightforward manner, and we have understanding and consensus within the Council. These are the major transport and railway uh, corridors, uh, the ports, and the digital infrastructure. A lot of them uh, have already been completed with the European uh, funding, and now uh, you know that we have the uh, Euro World Bank and the European Bank for uh, European Investment Bank, the Bank and EBRD. We have uh, set up panels to work until Friday so that uh, people can go home uh, having a clear vision on how all these uh, projects will be uh, financed. The toll systems will make sure that the low interest. Uh, um, uh, interest rate loans can be paid back and the grants uh, extended by the European Commission and some co-financing from the domestic budgets. I'm convinced that once this, um, uh, this map is in place, uh, the Western Balkans will be a good place to live within Europe. Mr. Weber is here now, a good friend of mine, and I have prepared uh, something for my discussion uh, in the evening on uh, and uh, alleviate their fears because the data speak for themselves. Macedonia, 
11 billion uh, GDP, 41 b billion for Serbia, Albanian, Albania, 13, Kosovo, 8 billion, Bosnia and Herzegovina, 17 billion, Montenegro, 4 billion. If we sum the, these figures up, it's almost 100 billion. Mikulic knows in Slovakia. Slovakia alone ha has 96 billion of GDP. So it's something like uh, ac uh, exceeding Slovakia and so much fear associated with this. Go figure. Bulgaria has 57 billion, uh, just to compare. Uh, same uh, po population number, they were much ahead of us, but, uh, and I think their political elite is aware of uh, having of having to join the EU as soon as possible. So in terms of population, um, the Western Balkans are smaller, taken together, are smaller than Romania. In terms of uh, GDP, uh, they are as uh, large as Slovakia. So why people fear that? Why would they do that, given that there are trillions of um, of euro of uh, GDP. This uh, uh, area has been generating wars and uh, huge expenses uh, subsequently. So, slowly um, holding a dialogue, a method, piecemeal. Uh, the, uh, Andre is is a witness of that, and so. At the end of the day, they all agreed, and now uh, everybody will be attending the council. We are going to have bilateral meetings. Uh, Madam May is coming uh, to Bulgaria too. Uh, Brexit uh, has been on, on a bumpy ride, um, but I very much hope, uh, and the colleagues uh, Zaev and Tsipras um, uh, will finally um, get over this uh, this issue with a name. We only hope, we are not giving advice, we only hope that this issue will be resolved. And just as um, President Tachi and President Vucic uh, uh, are encouraged to uh, show their European leadership, because you remember that in Skopje they refused uh, to shake hands. They should do it here so that when I talk to my colleagues, uh, I could um, state clearly that we have political leaders uh, with a strong civil sector that would make sure that this uh, happens, and we uh, are responsible uh, to them. Unfortunately, uh, a lot of our attention will be spent on uh, on the nuclear agreement with Iran, the commercial relations with the U.S. These two topics um, are emerging at a moment uh, when we are deeply concerned, uh, given uh, uh, the rate of casualties in uh, the Palestine. And we can't say that um, the, this uh, meeting of the Council is uh, being held in a favorable um, setting, because there are so many other very important uh, pressing issues, all the, co the conflict in uh, Syria, the refugee wave, um, um, all these um, all this uh, violence uh, generates even a stronger wave of uh, migrants. Andre put it right in uh, the elections in um, in uh, large uh, European countries were won uh, by non-systemic uh, political parties against the backdrop of the migration uh, issue. And I'm uh, glad that uh, the European Union is. Um, strongly protecting its own interests, and I hope that this trend will continue. Corridor number four, corridor number eight, and corridor number 10. 
it's beautiful. It will be beneficial for Croatia, for Serbia, for Macedonia, for Albania, for Montenegro, Bosnia and Herzegovina, for all these uh, Western, uh, Western Balkan countries, but also for Greece and Bulgaria as well. I wish you a very successful um, forum and uh, uh, do help us, help us because uh, if we don't help each other on the Balkans, uh, even God will not be able to help us. Uh, we have been able to bring over uh, the leaders of uh, the European Union, but we should uh, do our job too. Thank you very much for your attention and I wish you uh, good luck uh, at this um, forum. I'd like to uh, thank the official guests, uh, Prime Minister uh, Borisov, Prime Minister Plenkovic, uh, Mr. Weber and Mr. Zurinde for outlining uh, the main uh, topics that we're going to discuss um, uh, more thoroughly. Uh, it's a hashtag talk with a WB. And I think uh, we should have started using this uh, hashtag um, um, long ago. Um, I would like to ask you for two minutes of patience to rearrange um, the stage. And I'd like to uh, invite Vesela Cherneva. Without um, her, we could have uh, hardly uh, made this conference uh, possible because she has been the one uh, discussing uh, the issues of the Western uh, Balkans, not only for the last uh, five months, but for many years. Uh, and she is the true expert to um, kick off the first panel, uh, Vesela, please. Thank you very much. I will switch in English uh, because we want to uh, have a common language. I know that we understand each other, most of us in the region. <laughs> and yet, I think, um, given also the European context uh, of this uh, conversation, I'm going to switch in English. Of course, uh, um, we will be able to discuss in Bulgarian if you would prefer that as well. We are changing the stage and in the meantime I will ask all of our colleagues and friends from the region to come forward and to take seats here in the front rows. Goran, don't, don't uh, make me name names. <laughs> so if we, can, uh, if we can have the colleagues from the region who have come for this event from all the different countries in the region, it would be great to have you. And then I'm going to invite um, our speakers for this first panel. Foreign Minister Zaharieva. Uh, Nikola Dimitrov, we need a microphone for him as well. Has Madam Eichhorst arrived already? I don't see her in the, in the room. Okay. So, N Nicola, if you want to come, come forward. And then um, 
so the idea of this panel is basically to have a to have a conversation. I know um, that we have all listened to a lot of speeches on the topic of Western Balkans. We heard four excellent speeches just now. Um, and so we are going to try and have a talk, to have a conversation. We have the foreign ministers of Bulgaria and Macedonia here on the panel. Um, and we have a number of colleagues from the region sitting here in the front rows. You have microphones and uh, um, whenever you feel like you can intervene. Um, I would suggest that we do a conversation which is uh, beyond the, the level of declarations um, and we talk as honest as possible and I'm very happy that we have two foreign ministers who are uh, famous for being honest, um, so it's, uh, it's, it's going to be an interesting conversation. The state of the enlargement um, is not as rosy as we would like it to be. And uh, I think uh, f the fact that for the first time we do have some momentum to talk about the Western Balkans does not necessarily mean that we have also a momentum to talk about enlargement. In this moment, we welcome uh, Angelina Eichhorst as well. And so the question is, if we have a majority of the publics of the member states opposing further enlargement, um, there are different percentages, Eurobarometer says it's 47, others say it's 53, but in any event, we have at least, let's say, or approximately half of the Europeans opposing um, the enlargement. This is, by the way, not the case in Bulgaria. I guess it's not the case in Croatia. Uh, but it is definitely the case in some of the older member states, uh, including uh, Germany that was mentioned, but also France, the Netherlands probably, uh, and so on. And so I would say... Is it, the question is what, is, what is possible today, really? What is possible uh, for the publics, for the societies in the Western Balkans to hope for? Um, because I am afraid that if we don't calibrate those expectations, we may end up in the, this situation again, that they lie to us, that they, that they are going to be members, and we lie to them that we're going to enlarge. And so, if you have four minutes to answer the question, what would, okay, what would you say is possible? I will give the floor to Nicola, although maybe I should have started with Angelina. Okay, Nicola. So the question is, what is possible given that tomorrow all the leaders will come together? What is realistic in terms of the enlargement? Okay, uh, great to see you, Vesela. Thank you for uh, putting this panel together. I just landed from uh, the Netherlands, but I had a working visit of two days, met uh, the new minister, Steve Bloch, and the Parliament, European Committee, uh, the Committee on European Affairs. So I am, I have. Uh, a very fresh experience in terms of the thinking in a country that is among the founding countries and that has a shaken trust that the accession process actually works, that it can transform countries. Uh, and uh, I've heard this uh, strict and fair many times in these um, last two days. I think um, we have to believe that the perspective is not only words. I like the hashtag, talk with the Western Balkans, but I think we have to do a bit of walking this year as well. Because after the focus, after the renewed attention towards the region, the new strategy that mentions the word credibility, a summit 15 years after the Thessaloniki summit, the first promise, 2003, 2018, 
we have to have a success. And I think success comes when we really apply the strict and fair. I, having lived there and now part of this renewed, uh, I think more mature drive in Macedonia towards a European democracy, because we have learned some big lessons in the last years. I think we need the strict, because it's not about moving through the chapters, it's about using the process to change. We don't really want to join tomorrow because we're going to have the same country. But the accession process is the best tool that the EU has to help those who want to reform. And um, I think uh, Prime Minister Borisov mentioned that we have the last big challenge in terms of bilateral disputes. I think it will be a miracle if we are able to resolve it, but then miracles are possible. And we all need miracles nowadays. Uh, Ma Macedonia has lost a generation waiting, locked in this room uh, at the station. Uh, we see the European train, we have to catch it, it's a moving target. Uh, maybe I'll make a point between this decades old discussion deepening versus expanding, internal consolidation before we but I think, in terms of timing, these are not really conflicting tasks. Because uh, even the indicative timing of the Commission, 2025, gives us seven years to deal with the issues of the, Euro of the Eurozone and other challenges that are more on the inside of the European Union. Um, I think if we manage to find the key to unlock the door, and I think uh, we all must have, have it. I think in the last years we looked in the wrong century. Now I think we are today here in 2018. Uh, then it will be a tragedy if we are not allowed to start the accession talks. Uh, we have a very positive report this year of the nine fundamental areas under the spotlight of the European Commission, we have uh, good progress in five. Some of the more important ones, like freedom of expression, because we now know how important free media are. We know how important civil society is in our country. We work together to change, change the way we do politics, change our system, be more transparent. I told my Dutch friends, um, everything is now public and there is a competition between ministers in the government who spend less. And about two weeks ago there was a minister from a big country, everyone wanted to see him, no one really wanted to host him for lunch because it was a big delegation. So we are changing, we have, I'm finishing, we have a very angry public opinion, rightly so. And I think that is helpful, because the only way to make progress is to face reality, recognize a mistake, and then correct it. So I think in many ways, and Freedom House agrees with me, that Macedonia this year is the best chance for, for Europe to make a democratic breakthrough. And we have managed to halt a negative dynamic, but this is not enough. We need to achieve success and make it irreversible. So whether this is possible, yes. It's going to be easy, not really. There are still some countries who are not fully there. And it is our job in the way uh, we discuss issues with them, very frankly, uh, doing our homework at home. But also, and this is my last point, convincing them that Lord Robertson, he said this in Skopje, I heard him myself, in 2001, he said, if you can't ride two horses at the same time, you shouldn't be in the circus in the first place. <laughs> so we cannot consolidate the EU without really achieving successes when they are ripe in the Balkans.
Thanks a lot. So you think that miracles are possible? Ekaterina, ако ми разрешите към вас да се обърна. If you could please allow me to turn to you. What Bulgaria set as a task was a very very tough term in terms of the presidency, and even though it was very difficult to talk on the topic of the Western Balkans, the stake is uh, very high of this uh, conversation because what, what do you think is, is possible for the next s seven? Thank you very much, Vesla. Thank you very much, Eva, for, the, for organizing this forum. I'd like to thank for the very good question because many times you listen to our, to our speeches, our messages are clear. Bulgaria supports the European perspective for the Western Balkan countries and it's very important at these forums to be honest and to talk about what we can do. You mentioned a few figures. The last one I heard was 52%, but in any way, the surveys regarding the support to the enlargement is probably somewhere in the middle. Knowing how difficult it was at the beginning, the Prime Minister said so in his speech to convince the leaders and our partners that this is a very important topic and they have to embrace it. If I have to be honest, I'm very surprised that uh, the support is lower. The citizen support is very low, but I think it's a good start. I don't think this is problematic. This is the percentage of those who are against enlargement. And this means that there is a big majority who have an opinion and it's a negative opinion. My data shows 52%. This is what I saw from Eurobarometer last. But let's suppose that the citizens are divided in their opinion. Have we managed to convince everybody that this is a situation that will bring a lot of benefits? And if the members, st the, I don't think we've done this with respect to all member states. And Nikola, he came back from the Netherlands and all of the countries that are net payers and not just them, it seems that they still have an opposition. They are against a quick enlargement. Nobody says they are against the enlargement as a whole, but just postponing it endlessly. And Nikola, you, you've been, uh, you were, Macedonia is a, state, is a candidate status from 2005 and Albania since 2014. It is sh sure to, de to discourage and we've raised our expectations, but that they will, this will frustrate and maybe this will anger the citizens of these countries. What can we do? The task is we don't have to just prepare and explain why this is important, but the countries themselves from the Western Balkans, they have to show that they can make reforms. They have to show that they can de resolve their problems between themselves. Because if you ask me if they are afraid of something, the prime minister asked this, I don't think People in the West, uh, Western Europe, are afraid from the, the citizens and the new countries. But the worry is what will happen. What will happen when they become member uh, members? Will they transfer their own issues within the union? When they take every decision, and we have to make when we have to make compromi compromises, and we have to be unanimous on this. If there, there will these problems from the past, will they play a part in this decision-making? So the first thing that we have to do is to show that we can resolve the issues between ourselves. And as Nicola said, we have to live in now. We have to live now in, in this century, not in the wrong century. And we have to show that we resolve these issues honestly in an honest way, not just because 
we have a visa liber liberalization conditions. I'm just giving an example. We, the meetings, the work between think tanks and then NGOs, the people who have reputation in these countries between the business and the social partners. I'm convinced that this will contribute to give an impetus to politicians to start resolving these problems. So for me, we have to show maturity that we can resolve our problems ourselves and we can leave these problems in the past and we can work together apart from making reforms. So first we have to make we have to make reforms but we have to be able to resolve our issues. What is possible? I think it's possible that this year we can start the accession talks for beautiful beautiful Macedonia as the nickname as the nickname that my two colleagues use during the uh, negotiation talks. So, so we can start the negotiation talks with Albania. Uh, it's not easy, but still we have a chance to convince the countries who are skeptical and they believe that it's not the time. And we can show through the entire process that we can resolve our problems between ourselves. So I think this is possible, it's very possible, what we, and I'm sure that it will help this process of convincing the, these countries. Um, I have counted 11 border disputes in the Western Balkans, maybe there are more, maybe I have omitted some of them. And for those of you who have worked on the region 10 years ago, you will remember that that was never really an issue. And I think it was because people thought that in the grand scheme of the European integration, borders will not matter anyway. And so the fact that now borders have resurfaced, reappeared as issue, um, to, is to me uh, a worrying signal that um, the promise of integration has lost a little bit of its uh, uh, credibility. Um, Angelina, if you think about 2025, do you think that, for example, solving those 11 dossiers is possible? First of all, thanks for having me here um, with two creators and innovators and inspirers, I should say, um, because this is what uh, I think Sofia is about at the summit. This is really hope. Um, and I hope also a very strong sign of unity and perhaps even going into a new era, uh, whether it's up to 2025 or beyond. Um, I think we have all enough to do to take this at a long road, but deepening, maintaining, um, and really perhaps also looking at things in a different way also for us institutionally. Um, I have seen that, I'm living that on a daily basis back in Brussels where, thanks to the presidency, we have been able to put the motor uh, quite uh, in, a, in a big gear. I think that's very good. Uh, it is for me, it is uh, the motor of transformation. Um, it is big, it is huge, but as Ekaterina rightly said, there are a number of questions that need to be answered. And this is to me the focus where, need, where we need to look at now inside the European Union, the member states, better explain, take, take these perceptional issues which are always resurfacing, uh, take them at hand, address them. And it's about image building, but it's much more than that. Leading up to the summit and leading actually throughout the whole presidency, Ekaterina, you know, so many reports came out again about the Balkans. A lot has been rehashed, a lot has been uh, looked into again. Good critical voices, I like that. Um, I have no problem when you talk us, about us uh, bureaucrats in Brussels being, uh, you know, the, uh, there, are, there are many names we are being called, but usually we are being said as the one who wants to keep the status quo. Um, I would say, you know, the opposite is really true when you see what is, what is being done here, but 
it's easy to come up with an analysis from your perspective, from one point, um, but you have to also see how we have to work institutionally to get everybody on board. And that is uh, constantly the big challenge. So the strategy is a starting point up to 2025, a different way of working. Um, I believe we can overcome that hurdle of inside the member states working and make everybody see this as a win-win, as a clear interest. Um, when it comes to the border disputes, um, I happen to work intensively as a facilitator on, on some, and I think I can see, what I see is there is the commitment to work on this. Now, you've heard this often, and you say, yeah, you always say there's the commitment of the leaders, but what do they really do? Um, and that is the crux of the matter. I think we all have to be held to account in seeing what is really being done apart from the narrative and the words. Um, and it's probably not enough to say these days that we have been managing to avoid conflict, avoid violence. Um, you say absolutely, Ekaterina, but it's not enough to convince people that actually what is being done is really good and it's going into the right direction. And I take that. I take that and I think we have to face that on a, on a daily basis um, and work also with it. I'm only calling for you here, civil society, friends, but also the critics of the whole transformation process to engage more actively to really be much more, you know, it's good to be the backbencher and to criticize, but please engage in the discussions. Look up at the facts and the figures. Call us constantly to account on what is being done and how we do it and what can be done better. Come up with recommendations and solutions. I think very often in these processes we, we hear, um, rightly so, criticism, but we don't get enough ideas and solutions. And I think uh, if there's one thing that we try to keep very much into the machinery is the creativity. As a diplomat, you're not supposed to be creative. I don't see it that way. And I can tell you, my boss, Mrs. Mogherini, is, uh, who actually, she really wanted to be here. I apologize on her behalf. She will be later, uh, obviously, coming uh, to this historic event and meeting with all of you. Um, but it is a creativity and also believing in the people. You mentioned the Poles. There is still a huge, huge, huge support for the European Union in the Balkan. There's also an increasing support inside the European Union in the member states. Uh, we should not uh, neglect that. And I think we should put forward the positive stories and the things, the good things that happen. Uh, this is um, not because we are dreamers, uh, but this is because we also see that the good steps forward are always being overshadowed by more critical or negative news. So we have a, a real responsibility there. My short um, answer to your question is yes. Okay. <laughs> I, maybe I should ask, the question was about the border disputes. Maybe I should yeah, ask uh, which one you would think uh, would, would uh, be resolved first, but uh, maybe let's not gamble the, too much. Uh, <laughs> In terms of communicating the good stories, and I agree with you that we need more of that and we need more ideas, I was thinking about uh, the visit of President Vucic to Moscow last week, a huge picture of, uh, of the Serb president with uh, President Putin all over the Serb press. Um, this is something that the EU has difficulties, I think, competing with. Um, you know, this is a very, uh, the, the appeal of the alternative power, no matter what it means in the different countries, is, is very much there. And it limits how much the EU can or cannot do. Um, and, and I think um, I'm directing it to you, but it's actually to the, whole, uh, to the whole room. We do need more ideas on not only how to communicate, but what is that the EU is offering in the, in the medium term uh, to the people in the Western Balkans. With this, I turn to you. Um, we have a bunch of names here, but all of you are uh, more than, than welcome. I give the floor to Jovan. Uh, Jovan Teukarovic, you can speak from where you are. There is a mic behind you, actually. If you can keep it short, I will be very grateful. Yes, I'll use my... Can you hear me? Two minutes for three things to say. 
the first one, there is a danger that this summit tomorrow and together with our conference is running into, into troubles. I don't know what the declaration will be about and what the wording there will be, but I think it will be along the lines of a very lame title of the conference we are all participating in. So two striking missing words here are enlargement and membership. And this is actually what we got only three months after high enthusiasm we got from this document many times mentioned, uh, written by the uh, European Commission. We hail the Commission, actually, we are not critic. Now we criticize the member states, so be cool. Uh, commission is cool, member states are not. What a difference can three months make? We were flying at the beginning of February. I was flying also here in, in Sofia at another conference organized by, by Vesela. And now after that, actually, we've been given several cold showers, including the infamous for us uh, President Macron's speech uh, that asks, rightly so, for the reforms within the EU to be done before the enlargement. But two words I'm repeating, enlargement and membership have vanished. They're not there. And I'm afraid the whole atmosphere actually feels like, seems, I don't want to say stinks, but it actually, that's, that's the word, stinks like the atmosphere we had before 2017, when we were very happy to see the EU re-engage in and about the Western Balkans. The February strategy document was a kind of a culmination uh, for that. The second thing I, I want to mention is reading the, uh, the strategy of the uh, enlargement, this is how we actually renamed it somehow, uh, to our liking and to our hopes. Uh, it seems to me, in fact, that it's not about joint uh, common uh, destiny, uh, geography, history or values that the EU or the Commission was speaking about. The stress actually was on security. We are seen, this is my fear and hope at the same time, uh, primarily as the security partners of the EU now. So to protect or to contribute to the protection of the EU borders against the migrants and also uh, within the framework of the rising popularity of the EU competitors in the Balkans. So the Vucic story is more complicated. He came to Moscow from Ankara, in, in fact, where he had the same kind of uh, reception, and etc., etc. And the third thing I would like to finish with is a special responsibility that rests on, on neighbors of the Western Balkan hopefuls. And I would like to thank Bulgaria again for this great uh, advancement of, of uh, priorities within the EU, but others have to do something uh, similar, uh, including not having uh, disputes, uh, even the bizarre ones, some of them have with the, with the country, let's say, uh, which, is, which has to be hailed and well received. I'm not speaking now, of course, of Serbia. I'm speaking of Macedonia. If Macedonia and Albania are not granted the possibility or the, or the date for uh, membership uh, talks, negotiations, uh, my fears about, you know, the drop of ambitions uh, since February will become true. Thank you. Three very clear points. Krasen. We need a mic for him. Uh, thank you. Um, Two minutes. Yeah. I think when you talk about reforms, you presume from the very start that there is a problem. Uh, the biggest reform in Bulgaria before joining the EU was the public discontent with the tax on homemade trachea. So we had... Yeah. Uh, <laughs> So I see the, see the minister responsible for the negotiations. She remembers this already uh, very well. So there was a very strong political movement. It was called the joy of the people. And its, lo its slogan was, I will, say, I will tell it in Bulgarian, we don't, want, we don't want Europe, we don't want money, we want our brandy at the old prices, all day prices. And problems you're basically underlying you know, the negatives and the problems. 
this creates a very bad image for the, for the peninsula as such. So when you talk about good things, you basically focus on good things. So, and here, what is the principle? The principle is that what exists is possible. And what we have in the Western Balkans, we have 2001, five times, three times confirmed free trade agreement with the Western Balkans, only laterally liberalizing trade on behalf of the EU. It works perfectly. Seven times increase of the trade, 70% of every euro of income in the Western Balkans is the European Union. Mm -hmm. This works. What also works is the SEFTA. SEFTA moved from Central Europe to the Balkans. All the Balkans plus uh, Moldova are members of SEFTA. What is the merit of it? The merit of it is that you can invite new members. And if you invite, Mr. Dimitrov, for example, Ukraine, you increase the quality of trade with the Western Balkans. You enlarge the Western Balkans, you make a very good gesture to Mr. Putin. So, and Mr. Serbian president cannot do anything but agree on a new member with, uh, uh, with SEFTA. And then the Balkans will be able to trade not only with Ukraine, but also with all these, whatever, members of the Eurasian Union, where Ukrainians are very good to smuggle everything through Belarus. <laughs> Thank you. Okay, you wanted a policy idea, there you go. <laughs> <laughs> Ramsey. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Veseda. I come from the country where actually for a long time we don't debate in our reality, we debate on EU reports on our reality. And the fever these days is very high because, and expectations are high actually from this summit. Is it called summit finally or yes? And from the, the council next, uh, next month. I will use two key words. Uh, one, one actually I used, and we talked also a bit in Belgrade uh, a month ago. Uh, the first key word is sincerity, and the second key word is clarity. I don't think that there is sincerity in both sides. We pretend to reform, but we do make up. But on the other side, Europe lack uh, she looks more on the reasons to postpone, to delay, to do the wait, wait and see, because Europe is in crisis itself. It's not ready, as it was said also in the first session. We need an open talk here. Second is clarity. There is no clarity of criteria in the Europe side, and there is no, not full clarity of orientations in our side. The so-called Constructive ambiguity is not constructive anymore, I think. Criteria are some, sometimes vague, at least for my country, and sometimes a moving target. When it comes to, to clarity of orientation, I think uh, it was mentioned by Jovan that we see the policy, of, the policy of two chairs, we see countries looking for plan B, not Albania, thanks God, but uh, we, we have to wait and see here. I think there are three contexts and three dynamics which are important to, to, be, to, get, to be considered. One is the wider European context and dynamics. We are not the center of the, of the world, but of course we are one of the regions of Europe. And we have seen now, until now two approaches, the geopolitical, the acquis communitaire approach of Brussels and the geopolitical approach of Moscow, Ankara and some other countries. We need more geopolitics, I think, in this region from Europe. Second is the Balkan context, the regional context. Uh, of course, it's merit-based. Every country has to fulfill its uh, uh, homework. But we have to keep in mind that there are also some feelings that in some nations, including Albanians, they might feel left a bit behind, left aside. And we have the paradox that Kosovo, for example, the only, which is somehow a European protectorate, cannot travel freely to the protectorate. It's the only uh, 
country in Europe, which is uh, somehow ruled by Europe, but cannot travel to Europe. And the last one is the, the, the local contexts, which are, which are important. Saying yes or no next month, saying yes or no now or later, I think uh, this is a question of whom you support, reformist or anti-reformist. You encourage reformists or you give munition to populists who are behind the door. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. As you mentioned, Vesel, at the beginning, we have a momentum, and that is the general sense in the region that these at least first six months of 2018 brought back the Balkans uh, on the European agenda, political agenda. Um, but um, if we go back to business as usual after the positive messages, I think that we must think about EU accession and what else will really move this region forward. Because the business as usual approach was not delivering for the past 15 years. And I think, of course, first message to our own leaders. These countries must become part of the solution already today. Which means the Balkan leadership must show a much uh, 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 more intensive, proactive approach towards Europe, taking part in designing the future design and the future project of the European Union, mm -hmm. take leadership much more in uh, uh, designing the region's future, and here regional cooperation is key. And then the second message is to the EU, the member states and the EU institution. The Balkans should be allowed to be partner in designing the future European project. If we want to become part of this family, and EU must be reshaped, I think this is now a momentum, not only for the Balkans, it is also a momentum after all the, all the series of crises, after Brexit, for a serious thinking. But my appeal goes to the EU. Please include the Balkans in this debate and in this serious thinking, because it doesn't mean only that you will uh, gain additional brains and engagement of those societies which can enrich your debate and which can contribute to solutions, but it also means a special type of engagement and a special type of motivation to these countries, and it will also contribute to the EU accession process itself. Thank you. Thanks a lot. Uh, I proceed along the list. I think the question on reshaping Europe is very important. So the question is not only what we are going to see in the region in the next seven years, but what kind of Europe we'll have in seven years. So we should keep uh, uh, also that one on the, on the radar. Andrea and then Milen. And then I'll go back to the panel and then I'll come back to, to the three of you. Yes. Well. A fortnight ago in Skopje, we had a, a conference organized called Why Europe, Why Now? Two of our speakers today, sorry, Andrea Stojkovski, EuroThink Center for European Strategies, Macedonia, Skopje, Macedonia. <laughs> uh, a fortnight ago, we had in Skopje a conference organized with uh, the F Open Society Foundation called Why Europe, Why Now? Two of our speakers today were supposed to uh, be one of our panel, be part of our, one of our panels. Uh, unfortunately, they were innovating and creating the new Europe in Thessaloniki, uh, and they could not join us. But we discussed a lot of issues, among which uh, accession to the rule of law, bilateral disputes, and alter alternative powers. We came to a lot of conclusions that we are going to promote uh, next week. They are summarized into five reasons why Macedonia should open up accession negotiations this year, not the next one, or not any other year, but this year. 
but I would like to go along the lines of uh, the euphoria that uh, was uh, there and that uh, probably is not there anymore in Serbia. In Macedonia, there is still more, much euphoria present. Uh, we were asking our citizens in a survey called Eurometer, not the Eurobarometer. Uh, last year, in November, uh, in, which, in what amount of time they expect to see Macedonia join the EU? And in November, uh, there were about 28% or 29% of the population saying in five years' time. This March, so five months apart, it's already 33%. And if you go into up to 10 years, it goes to 52, which is a more realistic uh, time frame, 10 years. So euphoria is still the, much present. When we go into uh, bilateral issues or, well, bilateral issues, I'll, I'll leave it aside. Our ideal scenario for the country this year is a camel through the eye of the needle. And uh, our minister here is much in, much in charge of uh, leading that camel through the eye of the needle. Uh, but uh, when we go into why Macedonia should get an accession negotiation date this year, first of all, a clear and unconditioned recommendation. We've seen others of those in the past, but this one is, a, is much different. Two years ago, Macedonia was described as a captured state. This year, the Commission said that there is a mindset much different from the one before that supports reforms. And in the strategy of the Commission, there was speeches about, uh, talks about or phrases about captured states in all of the Western Balkans, but unlike the other countries of the Western Balkans where Commission expects, the Commission expects, or the European Union expects that the same elites that have been part of those, that cap state capture will release the state and capture the momentum, in Macedonia we already have a new elite that is pro-European, that supports reforms, does reforms, in consultation with civil society. So this is a success story that should be generously rewarded. Speaking about success stories, uh, Prime Minister Plinkovic said that uh, this is the final year of this Commission College, this is the final year of this European Parliament. Well, next year when you speak about success stories and enlargement, Macedonia will be the success story that you can promote because from a captured state with an illiberal regime, you made it possible with support of civil society in the country to turn the story around and have a success story, a democratic pro-European country that is acceding the European Union or negotiating. Going further, this was for the EU, much more. Going further very and very, 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 very briefly. Well, Balkan two minutes. Uh, very, very, very briefly. Consider, consider, this, consider this as, not as enlargement, but, but as consolidation. And it's very good that we have a map here, because Actually, the European Union is not enlarging with, Euro with the Western Balkans. Western Balkans is in the center of the European Union that we now see. Enlarging if it, we go further to the east. This is consolidation. And if you consolidate Western Balkans, EU will become a global player that it wants to be. Finally, finally, be aware of the lurking dangers on the road ahead. Sustained reforms can happen only if the process is opened, as Minister Zaharieva said. It's a long process, we all learn, and we become better at the end of the process. Dangers are lurking in the nationalism of the country or the local nationalists that are there. That euphoria that is still present can easily be deflated and turned into an, into an anger. We don't want to see that. Thanks. Thanks a lot. This was a motivating speech. Milen. Uh, good afternoon. I'm going to speak in my mother tongue. For the record, uh, I'm for, for Bulgarian Memory Foundation. I'm the uh, person who gave the 
I feel when um, I was the one who brought the fire from Jerusalem on Easter Day, and if it wasn't for me, I wouldn't have, you wouldn't have had it here. And I'm just talking about European integration in action. I'm just I just want to show you uh, uh, an agreement how we how the European enlargement can happen with federalization, ladies and gentlemen, with personal accountability of countries towards their neighbors because we have common history and common future in the European structures on the basis of a, a story in Germany because during Bismarck's time there were 200 German countries and they didn't know about each other and uh, they were existing, coexisting together for 80, uh, they were existing next to each other for 80 years and they had, they, they helped each other one of them helped the other enter the European Union and give people the real goals, give them a platform. For example, the Bosnians, uh, the, the Bosnians in, Ser in Serbia, they want to live in, they, they should understand what dem democracy is and what human rights is. At the same time, Croatia can look after Bosnia because they've been part of a federation, whether it was real or not. They, it was sustained by the West. But at some times it was even prosperous. But give give uh, Croatia a chance to help Bosnia enter the European Union because Bulgaria is a very good example. Our common history, our common if you, uh, future. We can enter into fe uh, federalization, which can be temporary. But you can uh, decide everything with a referendum. Kosovo and Albania can walk together towards the accession talks, like Romania and Bulgaria did. But they can be together as a nation and I will end with this the East uses churches to influence public opinion in the countries that we live and for propaganda and to against Europe um, and as per Russian instructions our our bishops decided to move us away from Macedonia and I'd like to thank you for the time you've given me and thank you for the great organization. I understand that there are differences in the expectations, but I don't think that Sofia, the, so the Sofia summit will be a cold shower. The truth is that there is a lot of difference between Thessaloniki and Sofia because in 2003, nobody had even a candidate status. We're still bearing the fruits from that. And at the moment, the four of the six countries have a candidate status then, which means that the process is developing in the council. And I am sure that I'm convinced that, why am I convinced? Because I remember what it was like uh, August, September and October before we uh, introduced our priorities, when we wanted to convince our partners with regards to the, access, uh, to the enlargement of the European Union and welcoming the Western Balkans. On, one, on Monday with the Ambassador Tanchev, we were at the General Questions Council and uh, all of the countries that spoke out who had the word to talk about the project that was on the agenda, where is the topic of enlargement? For the first time they asked, just one didn't ask the question, I think there were about 15 or 16. They wanted the President of the European Council to include the enlargement topic at the end uh, um, on, in the, uh, on the agenda of the Council at the end of June. So there's a difference because you can see what we managed to achieve together with the European Commission with the other member states, with the, our um, friends from the Western Balkans, and I'm convinced that if we give something specific if we have a concrete project which is the goal of the Sofia summit because this isn't just uh, we're not just going to talk about uh, the enlargement because there's a procedure 
if we take concrete measures to for financing and um, you'll be talking this in the next panel all of the 28 leaders of the European member states are here at this forum and I don't recall when at a European Council meeting they they were there and they are going to discuss the European perspective with the concrete programs and that lead to this European perspective. Yes, it's not going to be easy, but in no way is impossible. And I agree with Angelina that yes, things are possible. And yes, there are more reforms are needed. We need more to do more convincing. We have to convince part of uh, the member states, the European member states, but for, but the difference in the past that we achieved in the past six months is evident and it's very big. And I agree about the debate on Friday. We were together with uh, Nicola at uh, V4. Uh, that the we the the countries from the Visegrad group and the Cyprus and Slovenia and the countries from the Western Balkans and we shared during the conversations how we imagined together that the what the European Union will look like, what reforms have to be conducted. And we had really good ideas and suggestions from the candidate countries. And so when we want to be a family, we have to allow the countries from the Western Balkans, and I absolutely agree that they should uh, participate in the debate, in the decision making, and to form an opinion about how we imagine what we imagine we have to be like. Thank you very much. Would you like to, to go next? There was, a, I think, a specific question on the shape of Europe, but also the fact that the EU should be more geopolitical in the region. Uh, and I think uh, you're a very good uh, person to maybe tackle this. I, um, I'm, I'm glad from the interventions I heard that really, I believe we have a, a common sense that, you know, the days of, of what I said before, this <coughs> bureaucratic autopilot is over and that we are actually really working on transformation together. I understand when the ambitions level is high and a certain moment you see a strategy coming out and then you think, where does it lead to? But for us, this is all part of, of a process that really in the end, uh, we don't know when, but at the end and the sooner the better will actually lead to have that reunification of, of the continent. Uh, we are all working for. And I, and I think that is really important. I'm also glad that some of you actually have some ideas and, and I will answer the question on the reshaping of the future because if you go back again to the ideas the Commission put on the table in February, it's very much part of this, of having all six being part of the shaping of the future. Also to work how we can change institutionally. And these are very big questions. And member states don't necessarily like this. Uh, it has to be really find its place. It has to find its place to the consistency uh, we try to work towards. And the, the main question I have to everybody who questions enlargement, I say, look, you want all of us, all in the region, to transform. You want to have consolidated democracies. And in the same time, you do not see the win-win for that integration, that consolidation. Give me something else to work with. Frankly, I don't see it. We try to enlarge the enlargement. Huh? We, we talked about it before. In, in French, it's beautiful. Élargir um, l'élargissement. It's, it's to, to really put all the elements in there, and for good reasons, it's security. It is also migrations. It, it, it is a lot, a lot of culture. What have we been doing together on culture over the past years? Not enough. There's so much more that can be done together, not to replace a process, but really to deepen and to strengthen it. Um, and I, I, I see that happening because the dynamics now are very different. I, I thank you for mentioning also the Visegrad and the role of the neighbors, because this is new dynamics. They were not there before. And they're very, they're very, very, I would say, very exciting to work with. The intra-regional, how many times do you meet? You see each other more, I think, 
if I may say so, maybe then your family. <laughs> there, is, there is so much interactivity and that is really serious stuff that there because a, that is not just the walk and the talk, but that's really also the action. Um, and I see that only multiplying over time. I don't see that getting less. I see that multiplying and it's, it's gradually picking up also with, uh, with the other member states coming in. And if I may, bring in the dimension of the non member states, but who have a stake in working also with the region, Norway, Switzerland, you know, the, the ring around Ukraine was mentioned, others. That's, that's, this is, this is, these are the dimensions we work with now. Very different from a few years ago. So there is hope. Thanks a lot. Nicola, maybe there were a bunch of, uh, of questions or maybe uh, statements that concerned Macedonia. Um, I think also the ownership of the neighbors of the issues of the candidates is, is one that, uh, that invites you to, uh, to, have a, to have a word. And I would say, if you don't mind, give us your best bet what will happen with Macedonia if we don't see any movement in the next couple of weeks. <laughs> <laughs> One of the first lessons I learned in public speaking is never answer to hypothetical questions, to if questions. Briefly, and I'm going to uh, pinpoint to several elephants in this room. Um, and my key point is accession process always fails when we politicize. Regardless if we politicize to push a country forward, or to hold the country backward. And I think this strict and fair must mean that every country should be judged on its own merit. Because if you're talking about groups, that is politicization. Then you make one country depend dependent on something else. Politicization is also when we are afraid of European elections. This is a factor. Mm -hmm. Next spring, we have European elections. In some capitals, they are afraid to discuss even start of accession talks because they think that the public opinion will mix admission with the start of the journey. And that's another elephant in the room. And I think they have a responsibility to be leaders and to say engagement is less costly than commission and politicization. If we have a report of the Commission that says, with this country uh, A, we should open the accession talks, this should be a no-brainer for the member states. Unless there are major heavy bilateral disputes, this is not an excuse, but in particular where there are no bilateral disputes. If a member state doesn't follow, that means we are not really trusting the Commission. So I think we have a very different process to what the Slovak Prime Minister discussed about his country. It's more complex. We have front-loaded preconditions before the start of the accession talks. We have a focus on chapters 23 and 24. And I think the Commission is pushed to be more bold. And we saw what, in my country, one honest report did, the Pribe report. So, um, these are some of the elements that will influence this whole um, process. A federation was mentioned. I think the only federation that we want and is feasible in the region is the EU. I think this is more a vision that is not quite of this. We have two visions in the region, surrounded by EU member states in the same boat economically. European integration or ethnic borders and problems. We've seen what happened when we followed the logic about ethnic borders in the 90s. The only way for the future is European integration. Um, I think consistency is key. I think we, we have to come out of age in the Balkans. And I think what we did with Ekaterina with our friendship treaty, although I made a mistake talking about uh, how often we see each other, because 
We did this relatively fast, and with Nikos Kotsias, it's taking us longer. So I don't see Ekaterina as much as I see Nikos. <laughs> Uh, I, I see this as a growing up in our region. What we essentially did, to put it simply, is we separated the relations between the countries and we gave history to historians to be discussed, etc. So I think it's really high time for our region to produce more future than uh, to compete who, is, who had more glorious historical defeats. Or, or, who is more, or who is the oldest in our vision. Every single nation believes they're the oldest. You know? So I think it's time for us to be proud of what we can do today and tomorrow. And history is great, but I think it's time for, my, for us, for our generation, to produce something that we can be proud of. And I think this is something that we can be proud of, resolving delicate issues. If we have the other breakthrough, that will be a historic success, 27 years old dispute. And we need to also convince uh, our skeptical friends in, in the EU to be consistent. Consistency, and we want a chance to compete in reforms. Let's compete who fights corruption better and whose judges are more independent. Let's have that competition between countries that will be in the accession talks in, in the Balkans. And we have to also be open with European voters, not really hiding, and we have to show them and tell them that the alternative of failing Balkans is a bigger issue for the EU than investing and making this region a success. This was the speculation I was inviting you into. <laughs> <laughs> I forgot that question. No, it has not to be politicized. I'm fully share the opinion of Nicola because uh, uh, this, this morning I, uh, I participated in one of the site events. I'm fully sure we should explain to our uh, voters that it's cheap, uh, it's, uh, it's expensive, it's more expensive not to have a stable Balkans. And I remember the support before and after signing the Good Neighbor Relationship contract. It was lower, three times lower in Bulgaria, now it's 75%. Now it's 75% support for the European integration uh, of our neighboring country because we really explain to our citizens that we will be better together with them in the European family. So it's, it's our responsibility. And uh, we have to work too, and you too, Nikola, to also convince the, the leaders, uh, the colleagues, uh, to be brave. To be brave, showing these positive examples, and that's why I always, always mention our positive example, before and after. I see the pools in Greece the same, in the beginning of negotiations and now, and the trend is positive. When the politicians, the ministers are brave, and uh, uh, the politicians, the prime ministers, and explain, no matter of the uh, not so big support in the beginning of the of the policies. So, sorry. No, no, that's a very important point because I think this is part of why we are here. Uh, because it's the role of, of the people in this room to push uh, their politicians to move in the right direction rather than in the wrong direction, which also happens in the Balkans. We let Nicola go and uh, we know that he he is preparing uh, still part of what is going to happen and we hope is going to happen. Uh, we're, not going, <laughs> we're not going to ask you what is happening, but uh, we uh, keep fingers crossed and we hope that Macedonia is going to really give impetus also for the whole region by uh, resolving the name issue and coming uh, forward on the integration process. Thanks a lot for being here. So now we come back uh, and we start from that side. If you can please introduce yourself. We have the two ladies, then we have you, then Goran. Uh, and then we come back to our panel. We have half an hour to go. Uh, my name is uh, Nikolos Zifakis. I'm from 
representing the, the Martin Center at the University of Peloponnese. Uh, I will agree that 2018, the first half, was um, a very, very good, very many, a, a series of good news for the Balkans. Several documents, the strategy document, the progress reports, and the Sofia Declaration put in towards the change of climate. Nevertheless, the problem is the passage from wars to deeds. And there, there are three sets of uh, challenges that uh, will test the credibility of the process. The first is whether the countries themselves, we speak about the EU credibility, but whether the countries themselves will accelerate reforms towards the EU accession. The second test, and this is, at least it was a good news what happened a few days ago, is whether they, the Commission will follow up to its report where it mentioned about state, uh, state capture. And a few days ago, the Commission immediately and firmly reacted to the attack to a, a Montenegrin uh, investigative journalist. And this is what the region needs. It's an EU that is here also when there are bad news coming from the region to point out to them and to, and to warn. This is not, it, conditionality can no longer remain only com, uh, consisted of rewards. It should have also the downturn. And the third, the most difficult, and this is what uh, Nicola raised, is that unfortunately or fortunately, enlargement is both a technical and a political process. And this is because it requires a concurrence of all EU institutions. So you need both a commission and all EU members. And, the, and this concurrence cannot occur as frequently as planets align themselves in the solar system. We need it at least 70 times for each country. These are 35 accession chapters that should open and close. And here there are two issues that have very quickly, uh, I'll mention to them, have been arisen. The one is Macron's uh, uh, reaction which is not so complicated as we tend to dramatize in the Balkans, because what he's referring is the 2025 timetable is in line with the Juncker's plan for the reform of the EU, and also the EU strategy document prescri precisely prescribes how the EU should reform itself ahead of 2025. So this should not be a concern if things go smoothly. The second though, problem is that the enlargement strategy document is especially on bilateral disputes. Uh, spends much space and energy and bold letters on the Kosovo-Serbia dispute. And there you cannot expect that this will end up well when one of the two partners, because we speak about partners here in Sofia, not countries, is not necessarily having an EU perspective at the end. You can't expect Kosovo to cooperate in the globalization process if it is not clear and fair the rules of the game. And you cannot have Vucic and Tatsi meeting regularly and found a way to sit on the table and have EU, part, EU members refusing to sit by side of Kosovo. We cannot be harsher than Serbia on this question, no matter whether we are for or against the recognition of Kosovo. So it is a political and technical process, and they, they, they know it. This is the, games, this is the rules of the game. Uh, Nicola is right to ask a fair, a fair treatment, a fair assessment, it will also be political, and there is much work that needed on all these three fronts. Thank you. Thanks a lot for bringing this very important topic as well in the mix. Alida. Uh, Alida Vracic, Executive Director of Think Tank Populari from Sarajevo, but also a visiting fellow of the European Council of Foreign Relations. Well, the, the, the whole discussion is a little bit, um, I mean, for anyone who follows the Western Balkans, it seems like we had already this discussion at least once or twice in our lifetime, professional lifetime. So it's 2018 and we're allegedly again having this momentum and there is a readiness in, in, in the European Union and there are certain dates being sort of thrown up over there. But at the same time, we're, we're, we're avoiding to speak about what really is happening in the region. And what really is happening in the region are several profound uh, problems, one being, for example, immigration. So massively people are leaving the region, and not necessarily always for the economic reasons, but also because of chauvinism, nationalism, all sorts of things that are not necessarily related to the economic situation. Second thing is, is the influence of the third actors, as Esselen mentioned, Turkey, Russia, recently China a little bit, but also other countries. And they're all sort of very good at, at deepening their own context in the, in, the, in the Western Balkans. And here the question goes to the creativity that you mentioned very, very early in your, in your speech. 
how this creativity plays out exactly because i believe truly that solution for our issues are back in the region i don't think we should search for the solutions elsewhere and i'm not even convinced that the eu is 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 first good at multitasking issues and also is it now in the stage of really handling these, these uh, issues in the Western Balkans really well. So how this creativity plays out, what concrete things the EU can do to deepen its own context when it comes to citizens of the Western Balkans. I'm not talking about the political process, I'm talking about everything in parallel that actually really matters. So one thing is to be at this conference among people that think alike, know very much alike, but it's something completely different to discuss these matters with my parents who don't see European Union deepening its context and at the same time they see Turkey, they see uh, uh, Russia, they see all the folklore, they, they see everything that actually follows through. So what are the concretes really? Thank you. Thanks. What's Maya? Thank you so much. I'm um, trying to be contagious by the Mr. Dimitrov enthusiasm uh, that he showed uh, earlier today, but um, uh, I wanted to give you some proposals, especially to the Commission, uh, where that we are, uh, Maya Bovic, European Movement Serbia, and member of the board of European Movement International, uh, that the homework is ours and it is all up to us. But unfortunately, it seems we are not capable, if I can say, uh, to perform the reforms at the pace that, that, are necessary, that are necessary for the citizens of the Western Balkans. So European Movement Serbia prepared 12 proposals how to make the strategy, the policies, etc. instruments more ambitious in order to make European process more credible uh, and trustworthy for the citizens. I'm not talking about the political elites. Very important that the rule of law is uh, emphasized. We wanted to see really naming and shaming particularly in the country, individual country reports, very precise if the state is captured, institution is captured, where, when, why, how. Mm -hmm. um, then uh, the date is very important for the region, the, the indicative, tentative, whatever, we understand it's not written in stone. But giving some timeline perspective is important. That's why we propose that besides for the two front runners, EU makes an effort to devise, I know it's very bold, roadmaps with a clear timeline and with a clear date for the other countries in the process. For the stages, for the candidate status, maybe this can take this long, in cooperation, and maybe it, it, can, it can be achieved at this point uh, in, in the future. It's again tentative, indicative, <laughs> not something. Um, then uh, again, we talk a lot uh, about uh, social economic gap between the Western Balkans and the EU, and this is no way to be overcome without more financial engagement by the EU. Uh, we see in the new financial framework that it, uh, there is some more funds from the, from the EPA resources. There is other means that, in, in which this uh, can be done. There is old proposals from the EPA, national EPA coordinators from the Western Balkan countries to make linearization of the EPA so that the country has 2% of the GDP uh, assistance from the EU uh, in, in a year prior to becoming a member state. So uh, increasing cross-border cooperation, making Western Balkan guarantee um, uh, facility uh, um, bigger, etc. So uh, the third uh, uh, group of the proposals that will be coming in June <laughs> is uh, related to the more effective SAA implementation, uh, including mutual recognition agreements between Western Balkan countries and EU countries, so to make our export uh, uh, even, even, even more uh, uh, easier and, and, and better with, uh, with respect to the, to the EU, and to uh, address the issue of the state aid, which is very conspicuous in the, in the region. There is a lot of uh, malfunction, but the problem is that it can be used in line with the EU market rules, uh, in line with EU industrialization, innovation, etc., and it is not used. So, um, uh, it has to be more streamlined again by the EU, uh, we think. Uh, so this is uh, a group of the proposals that we are in the European movement preparing and uh, I think it's also um, to be consulted with the partners from the region. So I hope it will be helpful for all of us because unfortunately we don't see, uh, maybe I'm too pessimistic, the capacity of our political elites to do this without the clear, uh, more clear guidelines and, uh, and uh, measures from, by the EU. Thanks a lot. If you don't mind to restate maybe this uh, second group of issues for the on the second panel, 
the one about the ones about money, IPA funds, and so on, because I think we, we're going to discuss them then, and pass the microphone. Oh, Goran, okay. Goran Slanovic, Regino. So I actually have a question. Uh, I, it did happen so that I was in Thessaloniki, and I'm very happy to be in Sofia and to join others tomorrow as well. Then. It was only a month after Jinj was killed, a few months, and I had a clear idea, really, being together with Rugova, by the way, on the boat in Thessaloniki, so then it was possible. What is in the offer? And I had dreams about. As you mentioned other players, some have just been mentioned, I'll add China that somehow you forgot to mention. My question, so no speech, really a question for the two, and I'm very sorry Nicole is not here. What is the transformative power of the EU today? How would you describe transformative power today? Where is this battery, this engine? That is not clear to me 15 years after the Saloniki. Then, somehow, I was sure about the answer, today I'm not. As I was in the government, as well as in the civil society, please try to position yourself in the government. Uh, power coming from this side is, look, I'll side with you as long as you want me to side with you in the Security Council. That is the offer. From another angle, the offer is, I'll give you a loan and there will be a bridge, and there is a bridge two years after our meeting in the middle of Belgrade. They did it. What is? It has to do with the communication strategy of the EU. So please, be loud, try to give me an answer. How do you define it today? I'm really asking a question. Thank you. Please pass the mic, mic behind you. Thank you very much. Uh, even Goran stole me a part of my question, but uh, I think we can connect it. Uh, uh, to, we can contact, connect it somehow. My name is Momčilo Radulovic and I am president of European Movement in Montenegro, but also I am addressing here in the behalf of Regional Convention on European Integration of Western Balkans. It's a regional network of uh, NGOs and some of our partners are here from Serbia, from Macedonia as well. So for the last two and a half years we've been trying to uh, give our uh, 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 give our some kind of, uh, to put some efforts in many areas and especially in one area that is uh, emphasized by progress reports, and that's the relation between the governments and civil society organizations in the process of democratization and EU integration. So in, on 29th of June, we are going to launch one regional initiative called Balkan Voice, and we are standing all behind it, and uh, it's now official invitation to you to, to come and join us and help us in promotion of, of this initiative in which we are, in which we put commitments from both sides what we should do further to, uh, uh, to strengthen these relations in the EU integration process. But uh, the second issue is that, uh, first of all, thank you for your invitation and uh, uh, excellent place, excellent timing. Uh, I would like to go back for a second to corridors that uh, Prime Minister Boris showed. Mm. There is no corridor of any kind that is touching Montenegro. Montenegro is, for example, completely isolated in terms of corridors. So, uh, maybe now defined on that picture there was no that now I think that recently there is one between Serbia and Montenegro finally finally adopted as a EU corridor after decades or so but uh, what why I was mentioned not just because of Montenegro but I want to underline the the example smallest country which is the leader of EU, EU, smallest country in Western Balkans which is currently the leader of EU, EU integration process didn't get any support uh, uh, to build the road, motorway, uh, in Can EU. we do this on yes. the next panel? No, no, it's, it's, it's short, it's related to okay. this, uh, it's just a, a short introduction. So, uh, no loans from EU uh, side, but there is one side which gave us a loan, that was China. So, the loan from China is one billion. Mm. It's a loan, of course, but the whole assistance of the Berlin process is equal to one loan of China, only one, to the smallest country. The whole Berlin process is equal 
in promises of one billion. So I just want to underline that. So basically, I'm asking a question here. 95% of the banking system of Western Balkan countries is in the hands of banks from EU. So our money is in the hands of EU. So why cannot people of Balkans also be in the hands of EU? So you don't mind our money, but you, don't, you do mind us. So regarding that, uh, first I want to praise your work in, for declaration. I know that you fought a lot, that you had a big fight for even such declaration which we are not very happy about it because 2025 some, somehow has been lost in translation since February strategy to the declaration of Sofia. At least I read it last night carefully, I didn't find it, so maybe I'm wrong. So help us, tell us what, or advise us what, for example, people like myself, like Hedwig or Philip or Maya, how, what we should emphasize from the Sofia declaration to our people, to our, let's say, uh, 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 public in our respective countries, uh, wh what we should promote, you know, in order to maintain the leverage for EU in our countries. What we can extract from Sofia Declaration to do that. Thank you. Ognian. As far as I can see, there are a lot of people in this hall that are pro-European and that they support the enlargement process, so we don't have to convince each other, but we have to see what we can do in order to convince those who are not yet convinced, who do not believe in the um, inclusion of the Western Balkans in the European Union. From the the summit in Solon in 2003, when the European perspective of the Western Balkan was um, confirmed, 15 years have passed since then, and we didn't do much during these 15 years, which means that for this period of time, we have lost politi a political perspective for the, the Western Balkan countries to join the EU. We have lost a political perspective. We don't have a 15-year deadline that a uh, political perspective can wait. This is the meaning of the priority the Bulgarian uh, government accepted for the Bulgarian presidency of the European Council of the Council of the European Union to reaffirm the political perspective for the U Western Balkan countries to join the EU. And I think what's very important today, I think that what we have to hear, but at the summit which will take place tomorrow, uh, to the, uh, this evening between the 28 leaders first. Um, unlike 2003, at the moment, the European Union is not, as the Americans say, the only game in town when it comes to Western, the Western Balkans. There is an increasing geopolitical competition and uh, a lot of undue funds are used in this. And in the second place, there is a perspective that is um, put forward by President Juncker, 2025 is set as a horizon and some of the countries, when some of the countries may join, but I don't know how he defined this date to 2025, but maybe he liked the, the numbers, maybe Juncker liked the numbers. 2025 as the beginning of, of joining the EU, it has to be accompanied by a roadmap. And this roadmap, I would like to express a doubt that this roadmap will probably not be very well politically protected if it foresees the 20 and 2025, the Western Balkans to be part of the EU. And I hope that some of the countries will join by then, but in this roadmap, it, they, it has to be real, not, they have to be his, political, not historic efforts to help the region join the European EU. The EU. They have to be really real strategies for development, for institutional stability, so that when we walk, to, when we walk towards this date, then let's not think, when, when we reach that date, let's not think, well, who is ready, they have to be protected, and the European citizens have to be convinced that by jo the joining of the Western Balkans is not just 
uh, wish what is needed and is good for all of us. Thanks a lot because I think you turned around a little bit Goran's question on what is that the EU can do for us into how do we persuade the EU that it's a good thing to do something for us. Velko, uh, and then you're done. Мога ли да ви помоля една вода, докато донесете тук? Включене. Да. Авелко Иванов. Авелко Иванов, European Movement Bulgaria. I like I have thanks and suggestions and recommendations. I'd like to thank the Bulgarian presidency. I thank thank you for the Bulgarian presidency that it uh, puts the Western Balkans back on the European agenda and uh, I would like to and for the suggestion to uh, open the negotiations the presidency and the commission did their job very well and the European, but the biggest expectations are turned to the European Council where most of the opposition will be the recommendations are towards Macedonia, which is the most euphoric country, uh, recommendation based on our experience. We call our mistakes experience. Three recommendations in order for the communication to be successful and to be to have a high public opinion, uh, to be in support of joining the EU. You have to explain three things, not what the European Union is and what the uh, membership will bring, but you have to explain these three things, especially to the people from the Balkans. The first thing is the European Union is not a, the rich uncle which will give us a, a big um, heritage. Um, you have to, uh, solidarity is the main value, but it is based on competition. If you're not competitive, then your membership, whenever that happens, hopefully soon. It won't be a successful story. The second thing is the European Union. I'm sorry that I'm quoting Ivan Kaufing. It doesn't give gifts. And the third thing that I have, you have to understand is that the European Union is uh, not in charge of the house. It's not going to order you around. There are things that you have to do by yourselves, and the European Union can appreciate it and it can praise you, but don't expect them to resolve your internal problems. Thank you. There was a question there, and then I come back to Jordan, if you don't mind. Hi, my name is Susanna Grubišić. I'm Secretary General of the European Movement in Serbia. And I will refer to the title of a book that you can find at every airport. It's Economy Stupid. So it's about economy of the Western Balkans. And I really appreciate what Bulgarian Prime Minister said, that our GDP combined equals the GDP of Slovakia. That's how we stand. And there are even more horrifying data about the state of economy in the Western Balkans. We are at the 30 or 35 percent of average EU development. We will need heroic growth rates to uh, reach the European average in uh, 15 to 20 years, if our growth rates are 15, uh, 5 to 6 percent. But at the moment, our growth rates are much lower. In Serbia last year it was 1.9 only. This year the IMF predicts 3.3. So, how long it will take for us to, to reach the average growth, uh, the average uh, development of, of the EU countries? And uh, what is uh, another paradox? We are poorer now than 30 years ago. And Serbia is in the process of integration for 18 years. What went wrong? We were so much affected by the uh, of economic crisis in 2008 and 9, which annulled the previous growth, which was 5 or 6 percent, so that we cannot catch up easily. That's why we need assistance. That's why we need opening of structural funds before entering. That was in some working uh, uh, um, 
uh, working uh, strategy, uh, draft strategy of, uh, of enlargement, but of course it was not in the strategy itself. So uh, this is the biggest issue f for us, I think. And it, at least uh, the assistance in, in opening uh, structural funds before entering for entrepreneurship, for example, would be much helpful. And annulling or reducing roaming fares, which is also a talk in the town, would also be helpful. And increasing uh, our quotas for Erasmus+, Plus, uh, let's say, for participating in innovation, in, including us in digital agenda, etc., etc., can boost our economy. That's the only way forward. Thank you. Jordan Bujilov, who has probably a slightly different view. It's not only economy, it's also security. Oh, yeah, absolutely, Vesela. Uh, Jordan Bujilov, Sofijski Forum za Sigurnost. Jordan Bujilov, uh, Sofia Security Found, um, Council. Yes, there are a group of questions that will raise uh, the European citizens more because European citizens want to see how Europe uh, the, resolves the questions on security because all of the member states and the Western Balkans are under these risks, terrorism, migration, and I think that here there is a serious potential where the European Union and the Western Balkans can work in close partnership. We have already made a recommendation, a suggestion to see in which working groups of the European Union we can integrate the Western Balkans. And, for example, one of these groups is the Radicalization, network, uh, radicalization Awareness Network. This is not a body that discusses political questions, but it discusses very practical questions which are closely related to security. Apart from the Radicalization Network, let's see which other groups can welcome the Western Balkans. And this will be a message that these countries are walking towards European integration on one hand. On the other hand, this will be a contribution towards security of Europe as a whole and of the European Union. Thank you. But final words from our panel. Um, I would like maybe to highlight a couple. Um, the roadmap uh, that Ognian was talking about, um, the whole soft power notion, uh, what is uh, that uh, the EU is attractive by, uh, but also can we open financial help before accession, um, and whichever else you found uh, interesting, so please. Angelina, you want to go first? Um, it's interesting when you put it all together there, as you said, one reflect on the other. And uh, I own, I'm also thinking because, of course, I don't know to what extent uh, there is knowledge of what is actually tomorrow in the declaration and the annex that goes with it. It's, it's quite full of a lot of the ideas you're putting forward here. And um, that, that is somehow where I feel relieved in a way that uh, um, it's, it's, it's a huge package. Uh, that is being put forward uh, to work on. And frankly, that has to be done. Huh? It's, a, it's a lot of, uh, of work that will go with it. But there were a few things that come to mind um, when, I, when I listened to the comments. Um, one was the, the question on why don't you put timelines, huh? in a way? Why don't you get it? My question to you is why don't the leaders in the region put their timeline on their political agenda? And they say, I want my country to be in by this and this year. Because, as you know, for many, many reasons, internally we cannot do that. Uh, and you know, you know what the reasons are. It doesn't mean that we don't think in timelines. That's definitely clear, because we always have a target to work here towards. But, um, and I don't think all the leaders have done so, to be honest. I can think of only one who said, I want my country in by this and this. But, uh, and that's it. It's, and, in this vein, I can actually push back a lot to the leaders. Why don't they set their goals as triple mountain high? Uh, and why is it always the commission that has to come with all these deliverables? Do this on rule of law, do this on justice, do this on corruption, do this on, uh, on um, organized crime. Uh, frankly, that should be totally embedded in the political programs of the leaders in the region. 
Uh, we do it because we believe that's the transformation we would like to see happening and we want to be part of. It's normative, but it's also very concrete, the economy, as was mentioned. I take, that, I take your point fully. I think there's more with the economy than we are hearing. It's, there's much, much work, more work that needs to be done. But I believe we still have, and I hope, Goran, you agree, the normative credibility uh, in our Europeanization project. Because none of the other actors has an offer than what we have. None of them. Whether it's trade economy, but also social, cultural, and then we go to the values. Then we come to the deep crux of the matter. And I'm proud of Article 2 in the Treaty of Lisbon. I'm super proud of that when we talk about human dignity, freedom, human rights, democracy. These are not empty words. And this is why in Montenegro we do stand up when a journalist is being attacked and elsewhere. May not, it may not be enough. Maybe you say, why doesn't the European Union make every day big declarations about what we don't like in the region? Um, and we will not do the jamboree of, of the... We are already very declarative in many, many ways. But we do a lot behind, behind the doors. And this is all about rule of law. This is all about transparency and fighting corruption. Um, and I think that is exactly where what we have an offer, I believe. I don't see ourselves in competition with third partners. I don't see it like that at all. I never use the two chairs analogy. For me, you know, a leader wants to go and visit. He wants to have a particular relationship. Look, this is up to the people to decide. But I'm very confident what the European Union has on offer is simply the best offer. It's the most attractive one. Uh, and that will not change easily. But the creativity is needed when I see, for instance, uh, how... Okay, the third actors come in not playing by the rules, right? We know that. And actually, a number of your leaders come back and complain to us about those vast gifts and loans. <laughs> you, you know this very well, Ekaterina. And then we say, but okay, you don't want to play by the book. Here you go. You have the money, but then what do you do with it? So there are issues there, there are a lot of issues there, but and what we really still, what we are fighting for also internally in the European Union, because it doesn't stop with membership, your obligations you have in fulfilling all the criteria, is really keeping up these obligations on playing by the book and playing by the rule. So um, that's, I hope, is enough transformative power to convince Goran uh, 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 of this. I would leave it here. Thanks. Uh, <laughs> uh, Next panel. <laughs> Next panel. Uh, maybe we can ask yeah. also Minister Zakharyeva how that looks like from a European Council perspective. Uh, First, I'd like to start by saying that I'd like to thank uh, Ognia Minchev, who structured everything that the Bulgarian government wants to do as a, an objective to do after the political credibility comes back there has to be a clear plan how to carry this out there are good ideas but we have to be certain and that we have to divide the technical process of negotiations from the political process of finalizing the negotiations and we have to open the ch chapters why do we have the conditions to open one chapter per year who who sets this because you predetermine well 30 uh, the negotiations go to carry out for go on for 30 years from this perspective Of course, we have to be ready. Of course, we you have to have interconnectedness between actions before opening and beginning the negotiations. This is good for the candidates, not just for the European Union, because if they're not ready, then they ha can't move the process forward. And some of them are very expensive. Let's be honest about this. So from this perspective, there, a plan can be made. And I think the strategy of the Commission actually represents a plan 
according to the projects and the initiatives that we have to work on. And I really hope to see funds in there. There are pre-accession funds, and these are the resources of financing for the pre-accession process. And what's going to happen tomorrow with the participation of all financial institutions, big financial institutions that are here, and the accompanying format and forums with the transport ministers, if, that we have to find concrete financing for all of these projects and initiatives. And I'm going to finish by asking, with, by referring to a question that some of uh, you asked about the transformative power. This is uh, a wish. I know how much efforts we put in to get there. And I say this from personal experience that Europe will be more secure, more uh, a lot more stable, that there are other players that are trying everything possible to mislead citizens, to destabilize this region. So when you see the data and the public opinion in Serbia, who is the biggest investor, probably not the European Union, China's first and then maybe somebody else. If you see uh, these loans, because this this is not built with the, mo the money from China. And if you see all of the other things that can be seen on the media in these countries, that can be traced on the social media, that can be heard from the people who have to make the public opinion, have to dictate. Yes, you can see that there are other players there, but the truth is that I don't feel like someone who is promoting and giving everything to support the European perspective for the Western Balkans. Just like Angelina, I don't think this is a competition. I think that the choice is very evident. It's obvious that the transformative power is very so clear that if you only look at the neighboring countries, the figures before and after, that we, there's nothing that we have to prove. We have to fight to provide more funds, more help, and your leaders and your governments have to fight to make the reforms quicker. That's my opinion. But you, uh, we together, we have to fight for it, and I really agree that we have to keep the... Uh, uh, hello, Mr. President, Mr. Plevnir, I'm happy to see you. We have to keep the people from the Western Balkans in the Western Balkans, and we have to overcome the increasing nationalism. It's not just in the Western Balkans. We see it in the other member states. And together with them, with the people, we have to convince, we have to continue to convince the skeptics that your place is there, but just because you want this, not because we gave the figures at the beginning for the wish, uh, not, not because, you, because you want it, not because somebody is forcing you to do it. And I'm going to finish with what this, what Ognan said, we don't have to convince ourselves because we want it, but together with you, we have to work towards convincing the others who are still skeptical that the Western Balkan countries have to be part of the European Union. Thank you very much. There is always a moment in such forums where we tell a joke about the optimist who said that Serbia will be a member of the European Union during the Albanian presidency. And the pessimist says that Albania will become a member during the presidency of the of Serbian presidency. And I think that, especially in Sofia, this doesn't sound good because all of us know that in the end, it is in the interest of the region and in everybody's interest in Bulgaria and other places in the European Union. But I still thank you for thanking to thank you for helping us recalibrate uh, the expectations when it comes to the European Union and the region. And especially special thanks for all the ideas that you came up with. And we really hope that we can continue working on some of them. 
and during the next panel we're going to talk more specifically about especially about those who are connected with the next uh, budget framework uh, thing connected with the Berlin process and I think that this will be a very interesting and very specific discussion and we have about 10 minutes for coffee break and I'll be very grateful if um, five two if you could be back in the uh, hall thank you very much